So hi, um, welcome to the Rock My Age podcast. And today, Erica and I are going to have a three-way conversation with somebody who I have followed, or as I've just said, actually in my pre kind of conversation, um, have stalked for many, many years. Her name's Donna Lancaster. She runs, uh, most famous, I think, for running the Bridge Retreat, which is a six-day transformational program, which um, as a journalist, I've known a lot, a lot about because it seems particularly popular with the media and there's lots written about it. So if you want to um, check out what it's about, um, it's a really, um, really interesting program. I haven't dared to go on it yet, but, um, but you know, one day I will. Now, my interest in Donna came in my writing about grief and about um, trying to use grief as a transformation to find a way of living with it, first of all, but also to using it in a positive way. So that's where I first came across um, Donna. And I see her, I don't agree with having gurus because I think we need to build ourselves up. But if there was a guru in grief, for me, it would be Donna and her work. Um, around grief, loss, and that's not just about losing a person, but that's about all the various losses and transformations that we have as women. So lots and lots to talk about. Um, Erica, I know, has a real interest in the kind of um, changes that we have as older women as we're moving from the workplace, uh, maybe into different kinds of work or self-employment or, or simply um, retiring or um, transitioning to something else. So I'm really, really excited about this conversation. So first of all, I want to say welcome, Donna. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's so Thank great you. to have you here. Now, first of all, I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about what the bridge is, because I, I'm sure lots of people have heard about it. But explain what it's what it's what it sets out to do. Sure. I mean, the bridge is a, a six day originally uh, pre pandemic. It was a residential six day program. So it was a retreat. It was literally a period of time where people retreated from their everyday life. And we, um, you know, we uh, basically deliver the work in a house and we, we we recreate a kind of, if you like, a sort of very homely family nurturing experience for people, um, for them to basically to process whatever it is that they feel is holding them back in their lives. So for some people that is um, issues around loss and um, bereavement, death, and other people it's issues around things like depression, anxiety, understanding, um, you know, how they've come to be. So we get a lot of people that are in transition, that they've reached a point in their life where they've ticked all the boxes and, and it's like, I've got the, you know, I've got the money, I've got the job, I've got the car, I've got the kids, and I am still feel something's missing. So it's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically a retreat for your inner world. And it really, it, we, we get people from all walks of life to, that, that just know that they want to kind of uh, work on themselves in a way to, to fully live actually. And it's really about supporting people to process whatever is holding them back. Now I want to talk a minute about loss because I think loss is something, an actual loss of a, a loved one. Um, but first of all, I just want to hand over to Erica a minute because I think what is really interesting to us is that loss the kind of work you do is not just about losing a person it's much wider than that so can I just um I'm just gonna hand over to Erica for this part yeah I was uh, that's really thank you um Donna for that I was really interested in your word transition there um and also we talked a little bit earlier about resilience I think and both of those words we use a lot in kind of corporate environment but I've spoken to a lot of women recently who are in that kind of 45 50 often 55 60 coming up to retirement but also perhaps those that are 45 who are looking to do something different in their life but let go of the corporate environment some of the structures sometimes the status that they've built up over time. Sometimes they feel that that corporate world has defined them um, and they really struggle. And, and I think, you know, I've spoke to a lady recently who suffered a huge sense of loss coming out of that environment and took a long time actually, in her words, to stabilize herself again um, and to find other passions and other ways of, of, 
of being in a world where you don't have um, those things that are around you. I mean, I'd be really fascinated in whether you've come up against that with women uh, or and, and the support and, and what you recommend or how you work with them to, to work through that. Sure. I mean, I, I think it is, you know, the first thing I want to say is that grief in its definition is a natural emotional reaction to any kind of loss, any kind of loss. And it's got obviously the association with bereavement, understandably. But but um, there's something that this uh, a man called David Kessler, who uh, wrote a book, book called Finding Meaning Around Grief, and he um, he says, you know, grief is about the, the death of something or someone. And I think what you're describing, Erica, is that it's like the death of life as you know it. It's that big. You know, when you shift into you've got this uh, identity and you're very attached to that identity, which is understandable, as many of us are. You know, work is a big part of our lives, whether that be working in the home or working outside of the home or both that that forms our identity. And then when those things, uh, as they naturally do, shift, change, fall away, it's, it's, the, it's a time which feels really, really like facing death for some people. It's mm. like, if I'm not all these labels, who am I? What's left underneath that, you know? Mm. And so I think it is a, as big as facing death. That's what it feels like for some people, but it's certainly, as David Kessler says, a death of something. You know, and it is the, the identity piece. And I think alongside that with women as they're aging in a world that is obsessed with youth, um, you know, that brings again with the menopause and all those other changes, it brings on added dimensions in, in, in that um, uh, arena as well. So, you know, you're dealing with a lot from that kind of 45, 50 plus um, age range when you're, you're essentially not only maybe losing your identity around the career, um, but also, you know, for some women, there's very much a time when their marriage either or their relationships either need to really drastically change or they need to, you know, for, some, for some, certainly in my experience, or they need to end and, and, some, and again, another death. So for some people, children leaving home and then looking in the mirror and everything's not quite looking like it used to look. Mm. All of those are losses, you know, and they come with grief. And it's not just about vanity to, to age. I always say, Erica, that aging is the greatest spiritual practice because it teaches us the art of surrender and it teaches us to really, really go inside and let the ego attachments, the surface stuff fall away. Not easy. I'm certainly not there myself. <laughs> but, but, but you know what I mean? It, it, it is. Aging is by, by definition, for me, it is about, uh, it's a spiritual practice. It's, it really is. So you put all of that in the pot for one woman. That's a lot of loss. Yeah, and I, and I can really identify with that because when I, um, I ran a company, uh, a brand company for 32 years, I'm still very involved in it, but coming out of that um, uh, about five or six years ago, fully running it, and, and I, it was almost like my baby. And I know exactly what you're saying there around the feeling of loss. And at the same time, you know, your children growing up and leaving and you're suddenly you're, you're all, I almost kind of felt in a fog a little bit, I think. It was like, and I can see now when you're talking about that, the grief. I think you said something about sitting with the distress mm. uh, when you have grief. And for me, that feels very powerful because it's easy to fill your life up suddenly, isn't it? With lots of other stuff that you think, um, I don't know, fills the bucket so that you don't have to feel that loss or that grief. And for me, it really was a grief. Um, letting go of the business um, and, and passing that over um, to, to a very, very competent person who's running it now and running it very successfully. But it still felt a huge wrench and, and loss. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, it's like I, I totally relate because the, excuse me, creaking, I've got a very creaky chair, but um, it's not my bones. Yeah, could well be. But, um, yeah, I, I had that as well with the bridge, you know, the bridge is my baby. And I remember after the bridge is five years old and coming up to six next year, early next year. And I remember when about three years in feeling really kind of exhausted, you know, when you're really build, building up a new business and, um, and saying to my supervisor and saying, you know, 
I just want to hand this baby to somebody, a babysitter or someone, you know. And, <laughs> and, and he said, you know, he said, um, your baby's still only three, you know, and three-year-old babies still need attention and care. Mm. Yes, you need breaks. And, and it was just a really beautiful way of kind of getting, you know, that kind of link to the kind of ha seeing it as, as a birthing something different. And again, I think that's another thing as well for women, whether you could have children or not, um, that, that we have that mothering in us, instinct in many of us, not all of us, and there's the birthing of something. So for example, I'm working with a woman at the moment and she's really working with her grief around never being able to have children. Mm. And it's really for her, it's grieving, being with that, sitting with all of that emotion, whilst also she's starting to come alive to the idea of what else could I birth into the world? Mm. Might not be what I thought, a baby, mm. but I can, uh, you know, in the traditional sense, but it might be a different kind of birthing and being a mother in a different way in the world. And I think that's beautiful. But the key thing with all of this, as you know, my passion is people aren't taught, generally speaking, how to grieve the transition process. What people try to do is jump to the next thing, stuff down the feelings and say, OK, all, you know, all these deaths, as in loss of what we've talked about. Um, and then and then let's just jump, like you said, Erica, and get really busy and you know I'm a great believer that grief does not it's not it's a myth to say that time is a great healer Try, time is a great distancer mm. but it's not the same as healing yeah, and, and I, I, my sense of that also it's really interesting because I think it's um, I, I might be wrong here but for me speaking personally one often feels um, a bit guilty for you know, feeling loss or feeling grief on some of those things, because you think, well, I should be able to cope with that, um, you know, or I'm moving on to something more interesting. So why do I feel so sad, or actually sad mm -hmm. sometimes about those things? So, you know, I often think perhaps, and I say myself, but I think uh, talking to some of my friends often or other women, there is that sense that, well, I should just be able to deal with it. And you know that word resilience that you use earlier, I often think resilience is banded around quite a lot as a word. So you somehow feel you should be resilient. Uh, and I know that you do work and talk around the warrior woman. And, and you know, I think there's this thing, thing that we should all somehow be able to just deal with it um, mm -hmm. and move on and find something new to do. And it, and it feels sometimes like a very big um, sapping of one's energy when you're dealing with loss and grief. Absolutely. And, then, and and it also that whole what you've described to me is that kind of superwoman syndrome. It's like this expectation that we have to be able to, you know, like we were joking before we uh, started recording about spinning all the plates, you know, of our lives. And, and it's this this kind of expectation that we should be able to deal with the, all these things and just get on with it. And, and it's like, you know, yeah, yes, you can do that if you want to exist and then run yourself into the ground and get ill and burn out, etc. But I, you know, I'm in the business of helping people thrive and not just exist. And I'm in the business of supporting people to really live authentic lives and really live from a place of wholeheartedness, mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, putting their heart in a box, because there's so much grief that they haven't dared go anywhere near or don't even know that it needs to be dealt with and they just put it in a box and then they wonder why they feel like they're wading through treacle of their life because they are because carrying unprocessed uh, emotion is exhausting and it is very heavy <laughs> it's a heavy burden to carry mm -hmm. well, Donna on that on that point because something that um and as it, as you know I've written about grief I've talked and kind of had major losses in my life from young as well and unusual losses as well but I so I did the work went to the psychotherapist for years did the grief work did the talk he wrote a book I thought and I thought right I'm sorted now I'm done and and I just crashed into a wall and thought I, this doesn't fit, I mean, when you just said about distancing, I felt distance from the grief, but I felt completely dead. And it was only when I heard you speaking about living from the neck up. Mm -hmm. So 
for some somehow I think I had got into that place where I was I could talk beautifully about you know the grief process and you go through these stages and yes I'm at stage one stage two how do I work, work harder work harder and I think how it manifested in me because two things I want to talk about here is one it manifested in me in a complete inability to have any joy or play so I was working harder and harder and harder but I couldn't actually I would not I, I felt if I was going out for a drink with a friend or doing something I wanted to do that oh, for goodness sake it's a waste of time I need to be doing working harder harder and mm. um, so I want to ask you about that and I also want to add into that bit for something which you helped me to really break through is that I had not ex I had not experienced the grief in the body and so one thing you said about that dancing and about releasing through um, like Erica I teach yoga but I hadn't got this bit I hadn't got that connection of that physical holding on mm -hmm. and I just think I'm now right at the beginning of that journey mm -hmm. so, so there's quite a lot in there but can you unpick some of that and your yeah if I can remember the first question because you know menopausal memory I have to <laughs> I like to ask all these different questions. Yeah, I'm like, oh, write it down. <laughs> but, um, inability. To, so working from the neck up, that yeah. inability to process, you know, to really feel it. Yeah. So, um, and also being a little bit embarrassed to fall apart. I kind of, you know, yeah. I had to, um, and that physical feeling in the body. And I've started to release my body a bit. Yeah. I can kind of... Um, and that inability to feel joy was the... Yeah, I think that's, that is pivotal, that, that inability to feel joy. And I know you know the work of Brene Brown and she, you know, she talks about this, about you cannot, ex you cannot exclusively suppress some emotions. If you suppress grief, as an, an example, the, the emotions around grief, the sadness, the anger, the fear aspects of grief, um, you suppress your access to joy because it's like, a, it's a, a, you know, depression, depress. We yeah. depress our emotions and suppress the, our emotions. And then it, they, it's, it's like they come as a pack, if you like. And so your inability to, to grieve has a knock-on effect of the inability to, to access joy and feel in life, you know. And so there's that, that dimension to it. And I think also it sounds like from what you described, Debbie, that you kind of did what you it's almost like someone gave you a, a kind of um a tick box list and said this <laughs> yeah. is how you do grief and you're like okay this yeah. is how I do grief let me look okay therapy check did a bright yeah. book check you know and sometimes without realizing it we can we can uh, do the work without doing the work mm -hmm. so this is where we like you said you could talk about it. it's the neck up uh, stuff it's like you've got really great understanding about grief I'm sure mm -hmm. but if that doesn't land in your heart and it isn't processed through your body grief is visceral it lives in the body just like trauma all emotions in the body you know so you you can't you can with all respect and therapy saved my life it's amazing but you if you're just sitting in a therapist chair and you might have some tears, but your body is sitting in a chair, it's a blockage to actually the grief flowing, doing what it's meant to do, flow through you. And so that's when people, like I say, they get joyless and also a heaviness about them because everything energetically is blocked. Mm. And that's why we have to literally stand up out of the therapist's chair and start to bring in the body. That's why things like body psychotherapy is so, uh, is so powerful because you're using the two, you know, talking about the issues alongside then bringing in the body. And as you know, that's what we, we really focus at, um, on, on the bridge is healing through the body. You, you know, you've got to, I, I believe that we have to grieve with our whole body and that is like movement, dance, and, and, and grief is also primal. You know, if you've ever yourself um, heard or yourself had a grief cry, like a real true grief cry, that is a sound that is very primal. It's very primal, isn't it? And and it, it comes from somewhere. And I mean, I remember when my when my mum died, and she was just on her deathbed, and this sound came, and it was animal. 
Mm. And, I, and I was embarrassed. It was there was the kind of rational part of me saying mm. that I was in a hospice, you know, and all these poor people. But this sound, it just had to come out of me, you know, and I've worked with enough people to know that sound. And it's a very particular uh, cry. And it is the grief, what I call the grief cry. Um, what was the other thing? Donna, can I just ask you very, just to link to that? How does that how do you find that when you're working? I imagine more online right now. Because um, I imagine when people are going through that process, whether it's movement and dance and release or maybe other pieces like crying, which as you say is a very important part of that. Do you find it, that it, you can still hold the space for people online? And, and you know, do, do, does that work? I'm just, because I imagine there's a lot of people also right now needing support in these areas as well. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of loss at the moment happening as well as other areas for people to need support on I'd just be interested linked to that how do you find that's working yeah like I said before we were recording we were really Gabby and I were really pleasantly surprised because what we encourage people to do which again is going against especially if you're English is going against the kind of the, the sort of British stiff upper lip kind of mm. effect, which is that, that that grief should be hidden it's with our tears you know so especially women they cry and they say I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry like this. and what we encourage people to do online on a zoom session like this is to be in your emotions and to let other people bear witness to you in your emotions and and to be as i say shameless without shame about the, this um these emotions coming up so yeah we do the body-based stuff and then say we have a group check-in afterwards about how people are feeling once they've moved the body and people often will really cry and it's so healing and that is again a, a key part of the bridge online or in person is for people to bear witness to your pain without trying to fix it, take it away, you know, uh, t caretake or say that, you know, the right things just to be bear witness to your pain. And that's what we all, I believe really, really crave is someone to just say, and with their energy, with their attention, if not with their words, I see you, I yeah. hear you and you make sense to me. And that's what we needed as children when we were four. And that's what we need at 40, 50, 60. You know, it's uh, that energy of I see you, I hear you, and you mm -hmm. make sense to me. Um, so it's worked actually really beautifully uh, online. And, and, you know, we work with anger as part of grief because, again, so much of, um, especially for women, it's an emotion that they really don't want to go anywhere near. Um, many women associate anger um, with abuse and violence and destruction. And that's abuse, violence and destruction. That's not anger. We work with anger as a pure energy. It's an emotion. It's also uh, linked to life force. You know, anger and passion, I will say they're like close bedfellows or twins, you know, and if you really access pure anger, which most people have, they just don't know how to access it, especially around loss. Um, and then what comes through that energy, once that energy flows through, is you get your, your kind of life force back. That's why people really feel themselves coming back to life once they do this this body-based grieving, you know, like you were saying, Debbie, getting into the body and you feel yourself coming yeah. back to life. So, um, so Donna, on that, so, I mean, it's so fantastic what you just said. It so makes sense. And it just reminded me of the letter received a little while ago from a woman who said kind of that she, I think she was 60, coming to the end of her career. And she said, I've got nothing left now. She said, I was okay at work. And there's nothing else in my life. And I've got, haven't got much money. And I'm kind of, you know, it's just, that's, that's the end for me, really. And I just thought, so if people, I guess there's a lot of people who can't afford psychotherapy, can't afford any of these things. And I know you do run um, a program for, to, um, as bursaries for, for some, some people to go on your um, retreat. But I also guess some people, even going on your retreat would be terrifying. That idea would be terrifying. So what kind, can you give any kind of um, simple things that people can start to do? you know, in these really difficult times, likely to become much more difficult to start to kind of touch on some of these things without it being too scary or... Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a tricky one, Debbie, because I think with, with um, this, there's the individual grief, 
Mm. And then there's the collective grief. And let's not kid ourselves that in a pandemic, mm. that there's not, you know, many, many losses, not just the practical losses of, of people losing their jobs and some for some people, their livelihoods, their home, etc. But also losing connection. You know, we are tribal, we're relational, we belong in connection and community. So I think people are globally experiencing so many losses um, and and so there's we're, we're operating in the field of loss and the field of grief um, so so it, it's it's um, it's in you even if you don't know that what to do with it do you know what I mean so it's important I think that people don't feel overwhelmed and again that links to um, the work that we do is that we make sure that people access their grief but safely so you have to kind of a bit comes up and then you calm again and and that's what I would say in terms of people if they do um, want to support themselves to to release something like dance the work of Gabrielle Roth five rhythms it, it, you know this is perfect yeah. because she takes you on a journey with those five different musical um, rhythms to access different emotions and it, which includes also settling you back into yourself you know because that's an important part of when you're grieving with your body, as I call it, is that you need to also, you come, <clears throat> you shake the body up, you move, you get the, the body to access some of the emotion, you release, and then you need to calm the nervous system again. And that's also obviously where things like yoga, et cetera, can really support people as well to come back. But I, I'm a real great believer in, you know, things that people can do at home is, is, is dance. They can um, do uh, therapeutic shaking. We do that again on the bridge which is based on the work of Dr. Peter Levine, somatic experiencing. There's lots of free stuff online like um, TRE, the trauma release exercises, which is also for stress in the body. So it's a series of exercises that you can do that, that, that induce the body to shake, mm. um, which releases uh, stress and, uh, um, and grief and you know, emotions related to grief. But, but there's other practical things like, um, and it depends obviously who it is and what they're open to, but I really, I, I'm a real believer in um, writing letters and uh, handwriting letters, not on a computer typing, but because that- Why that, handwriting, Donna? Pardon? Why handwriting? Why because it actually, basically, when we write um, by, uh, by hand, it actually does something in the brain. If you uh, can't remember the details of it, but it basically shifts something in the brain. So it makes it easier for you to um, uh, access your emotions. So it's more, uh, yeah, there's some sort of shift that happens in the brain. And I think it's like, it's a bit like when you name a feeling, so when you actually say, what is this I'm feeling? Oh, I'm feeling anger or I'm feeling sad. Again, the brain has been proven that something happens in the brain. It's like a calibration, a recalibration. So it's kind of like, ah, oh, this is, you know, this is anger. This is what's happening in the body. And it's, it just kind of realigns. And it's what we do again with children is we're helping them to understand what's happening in their little bodies which are emotional machines you know little energy machines and when I say to my grandson you look angry to me he says basically in his little world oh this is she's nanny says that's anger so this is anger that I'm feeling and that in and of itself brings you know a settling because it's like ah oh, that's what I'm feeling but to come back to the letter so you handwrite the letter and the letter can be to and it's not something to send. Um, and, you know, there's some great, um, we use letter writing uh, uh, on the bridge and there's also some great um, uh, sentence stems, like beginning of sentences that support people to, to write letters in a particular way for, to support the grieving process. So there's a, a book, I think it's called The Grief Recovery Model or Method. Um, and it gives you a series of sentence stems specifically for you to support you to support you in accessing and releasing your grief. So that combination, as an example of writing to say the person that you've lost, or even the 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 the, the loss you feel around, you know, uh, a loss of a job or career or whatever, and you write about that in a very particular way, and then get up and you move the body. Um, it's a great combination along with ritual, you know, I love ritual. <laughs> yeah, ritual is, yeah. So uh, really interesting. I, I've just come back from a yoga retreat actually, and 
we had a big discussion about religion and spirituality actually and um, ritual came up as such a, a big thing about how we how we navigate life's changes and actually in the old days when we were all part of a religion you could see how you know kind of you had a shared belief set but in our more secular society there's a great big giant hole isn't there of how we how we know to navigate these things and um, so I love your work about ritual and about how looking back at how our ancestors dealt with things and how we can actually put other things in place to, to make us kind of feel the benefits of ritual without necessarily adhering to a particular religious doctrine. It's um, Absolutely. And I mean, I, I'm, I mean, this is a whole other podcast, I think. Don't get me started <laughs> with that. I feel so yeah. passionately, it's like baby in the bathwater. So many people have rejected religion and alongside that they've rejected anything about the otherness of life, anything that you might call spirituality, you know, and it, it's a really a, a huge loss for humanity is that people feel that they're yearning for a connection, which I would call to the divine and I'm not religious, yeah. um, but they, uh, but because they've said, oh no, all the dogma and blah, blah, I'm not interested in that for many people, yeah. um, that they're, they're really missing what I believe is, the, is the, the fundamentals of life, which is a spiritual foundation, which builds resilience and faith. And I'm not religious, but I have faith. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's a sad loss, another loss. And I mean, again, I talk about this in my work, but one of the big losses for many people is a loss of a connection to the otherness of life. And um, yeah, and the same with the loss of connection to creativity. It's another huge loss of so many people that they, they get so busy doing life. Mm. That unless you live a, a, as an artist or you have an artistic expression through your work, so many people, they say, oh, I used to sing. I used to dance, I used to perform, I used to love it. I used to ride horses, I used to, used to, used to, and they don't do any of those things anymore. And that that is kind of like a mini death. Yeah, yeah. The connection, um, Donna, that you're talking about there is, is fascinating, I think at the moment, particularly with COVID times for companies and culture, mm -hmm. because we've, um, there's quite a lot of research been done recently um, that says that you know, employees are really struggling with the idea of, feeling connected to a culture because they're sitting in their own rooms. You know, they haven't got any of the symbols or rituals um, that normally come with being in a corporate environment. And it doesn't have to be a corporate environment, in any work environment, you know, a creative environment. Um, but they haven't got those rituals, uh, whether that's the water cooler or, you know, a symbol of something that they all share and do together. Um, maybe it's just going out after work together, you know, for a drink or having a coffee with someone. So they haven't got those rituals and the sense of belonging and the sense of connection is really hard now for people. And I think particularly people joining a company, you know, how do they feel connected uh, and a sense of belonging? And I think the rituals piece right now is something that for my own side, I think is really important now mm -hmm. to help cultures um, keep a sense of their identity, the sense of beingness yes. of that culture you know we were laughing the other day but you know the idea do you remember the Kit Kat ad you know take a break to have a Kit Kat mm -hmm. the, but there was something about unwrapping the silver foil and you broke and maybe you shared it and you had a coffee with someone in and of itself that is a ritual mm -hmm. uh, it's a sense of connection transference you know relationship with someone else could be giving and receiving mm -hmm. and all those things are are, are part of a ritual and, and when you're sitting on your own in your home, um, it, it, you know, it's very hard to feel those connections now in a sense of belonging. So I think somehow companies to think about that and um, to think about what, how rituals now can support people, you know, whether that's taking a break, yes. everyone at a certain time comes on and has a coffee together or whatever that is, yes. or even a sense of smell sometimes. I was thinking, you know, how do you evoke a sense of beingness of, of a sense of identity for a company. Mm. I think right now we're going to have to think very creatively about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's fascinating and, and uh, I'm a big, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in ritual, especially around the grieving process. Again, Harvard back research proves that uh, grieve, grieving and ritual 
far more effective the the outcomes for people that grieve using ritual interestingly even if they don't believe in it i always say this on the bridge you can have an inner eye roll about the idea of setting around fires and chanting and and it will still work on you so there <laughs> <laughs> and and so there's that that you know and so a lot of the rituals we use are, are, are um based on my african you know part of my own uh, african side of my heritage and my ancestry and 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 really i got interested in particularly working with African rituals. But I really encourage people, like you're saying, Erica, is to what I call make the everyday sacred. Mm -hmm. Make the everyday sacred, do things ritualistically. We need rituals. And it's not just habits, it's real, like you said, a sense of ceremony, a sense of uh, uh, bringing people together, a marking transition. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not, I mean, for some, it might be a, a glass of wine or whatever, but it doesn't have to be, it, it's not about alcohol. And it's, it's, it's about making, uh, making different uh, phases of life, especially if people are working at home, marking the transitions, you know, and that is even things like uh, the importance of cleansing and not just washing the body th through a shower, but ending a day with a shower as in the working day and changing your clothes yeah. as a form of ritual where you literally move into a different phase of your life. These things are really important and people people sometimes forget that and they just do it with without consciousness and actually really to say, you know, okay, I'm going to end my day now and this is my ritual. I'm gonna get outside, I'm gonna walk in nature, I'm gonna have a shower and then you move into a different phase of your day. I think it's very important even if you're not in community. It's like setting the boundaries as well, isn't it? You know, that whole aspect of healthy boundaries. You know, knowing when you stop something. I know a lot of people are talking about the fact that we now kind of live at work. And for a lot of people, if you're in a small flat, that's what you're doing. And so to be able to set those boundaries, and I really like the idea of, you know, whatever that is, you know, you stop, you, 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 you're, you know, you somehow cleanse, as you say, or do something that, that shifts the energy and shifts the... Donna, I have a question for you on when you were talking about um, the movement and bringing up, and you were talking a lot about release of anxiety there. Um, because often with, there's a difference, um, well, the degrees of, I think you mentioned it depends where someone is in their journey. And I could imagine some people saying, well, if I suddenly released um, a lot, um, I, you know, I might feel like I need to release a lot, but actually I'm quite scared of that being left on my own afterwards. So I, you know, I might attend something, but if I'm online, you know, how do I get support afterwards or how do I feel maybe held or, you know, I, I could imagine some people might feel worried about that. And, and also particularly if someone's had trauma and it comes up in that process, you know, how, how do you find a sense of managing that for people? Yeah, I mean, the first thing in terms of the bridge, the first thing to say is we don't take everybody because it is a really deep yeah. process. Mm. So it needs, we, we interview, assess everybody first to make sure that it's the right time, that they are robust enough. They need to have a certain level of robustness. So if somebody had a partner that died last week and they were really devastated, especially if it was a sudden death, as an example, we wouldn't take them. It's not appropriate. They're much better to go to therapy, have one-to-one -one nurture support and then later perhaps we re review so that's the first thing to say especially with trauma you know we're trauma trained all of our all, all of our team are trauma trained but but we're really um we really have to be careful because you know we're in the business of wanting to support people to heal and we definitely don't want to harm anybody so we want to make sure and we do thorough assessments to make sure that it's the right it's the right program for them. And then it is, like I said, it is about making sure that we do a series of different uh, experiences that allow uh, an opening and then a closing, because that's what you need to do. So something like the body work, especially when we work with anger, sometimes people have a burst of rage that comes out of just sometimes just an energy not even at anything sometimes. And they have this burst of like, Rah! comes out of their body. And then we do a visualization, everything calming, calming, calming. And then we teach them a tool, which is called the self-parenting uh, visualization, which is basically how to, what I call hold their own hand, how to be with yourself in distress. And there's other things, I don't know, um, like, I don't know if you know, but when the whole George Floyd event happened, I did a, a grief ritual specifically for the black and 
community and, uh, and it was open to everybody but it was that was my intention and and um and uh and because i was i recognized that there are a lot of people out there that are carrying yeah. generations of trauma around uh, systemic racism so it felt like a lot of responsibility to get them through online uh to to work with their grief around racism so what i did is i created I got them to create as a preparation um, what I call the circle of love and it can be a circle of safety, it can be a cir circle of support, but, it, but it's basically something which has elements of maybe photographs of your loved ones, things that you feel resource you, uh, things from nature, so you know leaves, uh, feathers, pebbles, whatever, and people, everybody in advance, they created this circle of love and safety so that if they started to feel overwhelmed they step into the circle yeah. and you really feel the resource as you look at the photos you feel the and, and preferably it's even better if they have a, a garden where they can do it outside mm -hmm. um, and weather allowing bare feet on the on the earth and these are these are tools things that we teach people so that they can self soothe and the and and not be overwhelmed basically and of course we we they they can reach us if there was a, an issue where they were in a position of overwhelm but touch wood we don't tend to have those kind of issues because we've been doing it a long time so it's you know it's that kind of the pepsi thing you know we just yeah. you know, that, and it's not like yeah. Well, that's really helpful Donna thank you for that because I think that really helps support talk about that resource as well that people have and and I think people then sorry Erica no no go on sorry I was just going to say that the, the 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 key thing that I I like people to understand is when you self-soothe what you're what you're showing yourself is uh, not only is that an important uh, resilience building uh, technique, but it, you're showing yourself that you're not going to abandon yourself again. You're not going to, it's basically you start to trust yourself mm -hmm. just as you would if you went to a trusted friend when you're really distressed and they, you know, they held you. You're basically saying, I've got you, i.e. myself. Mm -hmm. And that really builds that resilience, that real core resilience and that self-trust. You know, it's like I can, no matter what life throws at me, I can hold my own hand. And that is why so many people, I believe, in lockdown struggle so much is because they don't have these, because we're not taught yeah. these these um, skills are, and resources around building inner resilience. Mm -hmm. Donna, thank you. You just, just covered so much. Just be, just, and, I, and I think some really helpful tools as well there mm. that people can take away. And, and um, if people, um, so you are running your bridge online mm -hmm. and they can go in through the website to, um, to, to find out more about that. Yeah. Um, so that, that's great. So Donna, um, I suppose lastly, just to wrap up um, this wonderful conversation, thank you so much, so much rich um, ideas and resources to share. Is there one thing that you like to leave people with, just a sense of positive um, kind of affirmation or something that right now they can be thinking of related to grief and loss and what, you know, the challenging times we're living in right now? Sure. I mean, I think the key message that I'd like people to receive is that the grief process is a really grieving is a gateway to joy it really brings us back to life if we're if we're courageous enough to to face and turn towards our emotional pain it one it won't last forever and two what it brings is it, you know i always say that if you go close to the wound you will see there's a doorway and if you dare to go through that doorway on the other side lies peace so that would be my 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 message is grief really if you do dare to do your grief work which i hope you do it brings such joy honestly i'm such a joyful person because i i grieve <laughs> <laughs> donna thank you thank you pleasure. so much such a pleasure